extremely difficult to not time travel when you go through a portal. It takes a lot of work to actually not time travel, which is another thing that, you know, multiple people say this, and you're like, where did that come from? I would have never thought of that. So what I'm trying to tell you guys is there's all these details, and they're so consistent from one person to the next person to the next person to the next person. And in the, in the Montauk project, they had this one wave. It was like a 20-year wave, a sine wave that would take 20 years to complete. And when somebody was in a certain point through the portal, because when you actually tr travel through the one that Montauk had, apparently this is what Henry Deacon was calling the ancient stargates. There's ancient stargates and modern stargates. Modern stargate, it, you just pop. It, and you don't even feel anything. It might be like, you know, like Bob Dean r r said that it was like a sudden electrical shock in your body, but it's almost imperceptible. And I even, he, he even told me one time he reached down for his briefcase right as it was happening and then didn't even realize until he stood up that he'd actually been through it and he was disappointed because he wanted to feel something, but there's nothing to feel. So that's a modern portal. A modern portal, boop, you don't feel anything. Ancient portals... The ones that were built a long time ago can be very, very rough. This is, from what guys like Henry Deacon and other insiders reported to me, you're going down a tunnel of light, similar to what you see in various movies. There is a visible tunnel, and it's shifting and turning like you see in the movie Contact. And the psychological impact of this can be very, very extreme. There are a certain number of people, a good number of people, if you send them through an ancient stargate, they will never recover. Their mental health will never recover from going through that portal. They're done. They come out the other side and they're never the same. They're broken. Because apparently you need to have reached a certain level of spiritual maturity to be able to actually handle this experience. It's not just something that happens. You don't just get a nice ride. So when people went through the Montauk project from the seat from the UFO and they went through that portal, it was one of these bumping and jostling rides through a, a wormhole. And then interestingly enough, as you're going through that wormhole, they can tell where in time you are by how far this 20-year sine wave has gone. Okay? So they know if you were to suddenly pull out of that wormhole at a certain point, they know exactly where in time you're going to land. So one of the things, and again, this is something I heard from more than one insider, Okay, more than one insider said the same thing, which is that they got to December 20, right around December 2012, they didn't have it down to the day, but they could, they could calibrate it pretty closely. And at that point, these guys would hit some kind of wall, like they're shooting through this wormhole tunnel, and it's whipping and turning, and all this crazy stuff is happening to you, and it's color, and it's light, and, and then you hit this, this wall, and it's as if your entire body dematerializes into light particles. That's what it feels like. And all of a sudden, you go into this total psychedelic cosmic consciousness as if what you hear about when people say they went to the light in a near-death experience. I saw God. I saw the light. I saw the Creator. Basically, these guys are reporting the same thing, and they don't even really know, you know, words are like blunt stone knives when you need a diamond-tipped scalpel. Words don't give you the tools to explain what this thing is. They would say things like that they felt as if they were as big as the galaxy and as small as a subatomic particle at the same time. They are everywhere and they are nowhere. And it is absolute bliss and ecstasy beyond your wildest imagination. And they would have no time. This thing could go on for what seems like an eternity. You don't have any concept of how long it's been. It's like it's always there, and you just tap into foreverness. So imagine what that's like. You're trying to send people into the future. They hit this wall at the end of 2012. They dematerialize into particles. And then eventually... After they've had what could be, you know, who knows how long of an experience in this, in this pure consciousness, then they keep on going, and then 
they go into some kind of future reality, but those realities now appear to be a construct from their own psychology. This is one of the things that I heard from more than one insider. Their own mind creates what they see after this wall. And so it's variable. There's no fixed points anymore. You could send two different guys to apparently the same place and they're going to have a totally divergent experience. And so one of the weird things that happened was some of these guys that went through this thing, after they got through the full out, they'd see this weird mechanical horse. And that's what's on the cover of the Montauk Project book. There was this weird room that they would go to and there's this kind of black, funny-looking met metallic horse rearing up on its front legs. And I guess because the, the theory was that because different people saw this, that it created some kind of thought form construct that they were able to interact with. And then you could send other people to it, but different people would see it differently. The horse might be a different color or it might not even be there. So it's, it's a very strange series of things. So you have to understand... I'm looking at the end of the Mayan calendar. I'm looking at the fact that the Mayan calendar cycles are charting accurate planetary motions. This includes the 260-day Tzolkin, which charts all the inner planets' rotations. They're all common denominators of 260 days multiplied by a certain number. Exactly, like down to the decimal point. Same thing with the Katun, which is a 20-year cycle, roughly speaking. Same thing with the Baktun, which is 144,000 days or roughly about 400 years. The Mayan calendar is charting planetary motions. And how the heck did these so-called primitive people, first of all, how the hell did they build pyramids? Why do you get pyramids on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean in seemingly geographically isolated cultures, and yet they're not? Because even the base perimeter of the Pyramid of the Sun in Teotihuacan is exactly the same as the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Oh, yeah, it's a coincidence. Right. The only difference between the two pyramid cultures is that one of them is straight and one of them goes in steps. Big freaking deal. Let's not argue over little niceties like that. Let's look at the fact that everybody in the world is taking gigantic blocks of stone and tossing them around like they were Lego blocks. <laughs> and there's nobody walking around in daddy diapers and doing this stuff in today's world in, in the jungle. Sorry. I had to let that joke grenade kind of simmer and <laughs> <laughs> Daddy diapers, oh yeah, right. <laughs> Timing is everything in comedy, you know? <laughs> so we have the proof right in front of us. There's some big, big things going on. There's some big mysteries that have not been resolved. And this is frustrating. And then I'm seeing, okay, well, the Mayans clearly had some kind of advanced technology. They clearly could build these amazing structures, and they left behind a calculator. And we know it's a celestial calculator because all the cycles of the Mayan calendar calibrate to the planetary orbits. And they even calibrate to the rotation inside the Earth's core, which is slightly different than the rest of the outside of the Earth, which takes about 400 years to revolve on its axis, and that's scientifically proven. So the Katun of 144 days, or the Bakhtun rather, the Bakhtun is cataloging that movement. All this interesting stuff about the Mayan calendar, and it supposedly ends on December 21st, 2012. And you know how many times people in our community have tried to manipulate the date. Oh, well, the Gregorian calendar, you have to actually adjust by four years, which means it's right now. Ah! Buy my book. Buy my DVD. <laughs> <laughs> How many times have we heard the Gregorian calendar argument for the friggin' Mayan calendar? How many different ways could they have screwed it up? Whatever suits the guy that's selling the book. I looked into all the data of the cycles, and I concluded that the cycles were actually right, and it was 2012. And I did a lot of research on this. Then you also have these ages of the zodiac that are 2,160 years long, and the movement from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius lands right smack dab on the end of December 2012 there. 
So I'm out there hearing from people talking from Looking Glass, and Looking Glass has two timelines, as I said. They merge at the end of 2012. And they're like flickering so fast you can't see anything anymore. I'm hearing about people in 1981 through 83 flying through these portals in the Montauk Project, hitting a wall, turning into light, having a God consciousness experience, and then nothing after that time is solid. And I say, you know what? These experiences sound an awful lot like the idea of ascension. Something big happens to us. There's some spiritual transformation that we're going to go through. There's some major, major evolutionary quantum leap in what it means to be human. So 2012 comes, and I'm looking at this, and I had also been getting dreams and messages from extraterrestrials, what I thought to be. I'd had incredible dreams starting when I read this Law of One material, in which, for example, I see a UFO, and I'm, I'm so excited. It's, I had the rock star effect, the wrong rock star effect, right? Oh, my God, you know, I'm so excited. And it goes, poof, and this thing comes out, and it's spinning really fast. <laughs> comes down, lands in the ground, and it's this telephone, but it's got sharp edges on it, and it digs into the ground. And it's an old-fashioned rotary dial phone with the little squiggly cord, and it starts ringing. <laughs> and then my hand is shaking, and then I wake up. <laughs> I had a dream where an extraterrestrial being shows up in front of me, and this wind tornado comes from behind him, and all these books are flying at my face, and it's all the 300-plus books that I'd read since I got into this stuff back in 1993 when I really started to binge on books, the paranormal. Every book that goes by me, it's like the entire contents are downloading into my brain and I'm able to see the whole thing like a big matrix. And it was about 300 books. And I was aware of each one of them. I had another dream where there was a being, like a ghost, and he was trying to do the electronic, electromagnetic voice phenomenon, or EVP, where I hit record and then he talks, and then after it's over, you play the tape back, and you hear this whispering voice. It's very creepy. <laughs> You've heard about EVP. I mean, that was a big thing in the 90s when Art Bell was really at his peak. And there's some really strange stuff with EVP. Some of it definitely seems to be real. It was done under controlled conditions. You go to a haunted house. You hit record. Nobody's hearing anything. You go back and listen to the tape, and there's this creepy whispering voice. So in the dream, this being is trying to do EVP through me, and then he concludes, well, that can't work, but David, here's an idea. You can hear me, so why don't I tell you what I want to say, and then you dictate it into the tape recorder. So I, after a while of having enough of these dreams, and it's like, well, all these very powerful dreams are saying, the beings want to connect with me. They want to talk to me. I had a final experience, which was my colleague, Joe Mason, not a Freemason, it just so happens his last name was Mason, interestingly enough. He had a website at the time, I think he still does, called greatdreams.com. And he was a frequent participant on Hoagland's message board, as was I. And he starts talking to me about all this synchronicity stuff, and I'm seeing all these numbers on clocks. Here's another guy who seems to go way beyond what I knew about the numbers. He's equating them with crop circle formations. He's equating crop circle formations with prophecies, with extraterrestrial beings. He's got an incredible encyclopedic knowledge of mythology, ancient civilizations, all these interesting pieces that he's tying together. And I finally called him on the phone, and I'm falling asleep, and I'm very, very, very tired. I can barely stay awake. But he's giving me so much amazing information that I'm just trying to write it down. I'm just trying, and I'm barely conscious. But I'm listening to his voice, trying to write it down. In this call, he talks to me about something called the dream voice. And he said that the dream voice was a phenomenon that you hear in the morning when you can remember your dreams. Now, I'm remembering my dreams every morning. That's a common thing for me. I get detailed, amazing dreams every day. So he says, when you can still remember your dreams and you keep yourself in a very deep state of meditation, listen to the background noise. If it sounds like there's a commercial running on a TV in the other room, 
Listen over here. You'll notice it's in a direction. It might be over to your left. It might be behind you. It might be off to the side on the right, kind of halfway between east and north. It might have a vertical height. Find out where that source of talking is coming from. Pay attention to it and try to listen to it. But then he also said, and this was consistent with the remote viewing, don't analyze anything. If it sounds totally nonsensical, if it sounds like a complete word salad of gobbledygook, that's terrific. Write it down exactly the way you hear it. And he's telling me this, and I'm getting so excited, and he's talking about crop circles and 11-11 and all this crazy stuff. I, I, I finally pass out after we'd been on the phone for, I don't know, four hours. I had all these notes in my notebook. I wake up the next morning, couldn't remember my dream, which was very upsetting, and I'm very, very tired. And, I, and I'm hearing him talking. It's just like it was last night. He's still talking. I said, I know. I said, that son of a bitch. How did he do this? So I'm writing down all of his stuff. And it turns out that it's, it's this voice that speaks in very weird cryptic language. And it started to predict the future so accurately, so many times, that I would get behind almost by a month in my transcriptions. I'd have a stack of cassettes on my desk, and I would pop one into the tape recorder, I'd hit play, I'd start transcribing, it could have been a month ago, and it's describing what was happening to me right before I sat down. And it does this every single time I start transcribing. And this goes on through... The end of 1996 is when it started, November 10th, 96, through 97, 98, 99, 2000. And I'm having amazing stuff happen. In the beginning, in the first couple of years, I was doing it almost every day. And this voice so accurately predicted the future that I, it totally had me throw away my concept of time. Now, they never said in this that, they, that it was going to happen in 2012, but I was very much getting a message about ascension. I was very much getting... Whatever this voice was telling me something really fantastic is going to be happening to the planet. And a lot of times, although I didn't understand it at the time, and it's in my notes, and I'm going to bring these out when I, I'm working on my new book now, Awakening in the Dream. I'm really going to be, actually, right after this conference is when I'm going to write most of it. I'm, go, I'm going to show you guys the notes of the original, and I'll probably even bring out audio transcripts because I'm dictating this whispering, seeing beings that look Nordic in white robes who appear to be telling me this stuff as it's happening. But it ended up, once I started to put this stuff on the internet, that the shame factor, the number of haters, and then I even put some of the audio out. Now, you got to understand, if you do this technique right, you're barely conscious. You don't listen to what you're saying. It's going to sound like a robotic monotone, and it's very slow. Oh, my God, that's the devil. How the hell did you get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John written, guys? I mean, come on. People have been able to do this. Sacred, inspired texts have been going on all throughout history, and they have amazing prophecies in them. I had no idea when all this started where it was going to go, but... It was only first with Emory Smith popping up in 2009. Here's a guy claiming that he's autopsied 3,000 different types of biological specimens during his time in an underground military base. 3,000 different types, including over 1,000 intact bodies that are all different, but basically more or less human-like. He calls it the five-star pattern. That was in 2009. And he's given me all this great stuff. So Emery only came forward after grievous threats against his life multiple times. And I said, if you don't come forward, they're going to get you. By that point, everybody had heard from Corey Good already. Corey had written me as far back, I think, as 2008 or something, 2009. But he didn't actually step forward and tell me what he really knew until 2014. And he wrote three people when he started. He wrote Benjamin Fulford, Kerry Cassidy, and myself. Fulford passed. Kerry actually got to him first. I just kind of held back and said, let's see what happens with this, you know? When Corey started talking to me, 
Here's a guy who's got all of the different pieces from every insider. There literally were things from every other person I'd met that he said. Oh, yeah, I know about Looking Glass. Oh, yeah, the portal and the shimmery thing on the edge. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whew. So I, I was scrambling like crazy to write everything down that he said. We were talking almost on a daily basis, and all I'm doing is asking questions, and he's answering them. And from probably November, and I recorded everything, so I still have all the recordings of those original conversations. And there's probably some stuff in there that we don't want people hearing, so we're not just going to dump them on the Internet. <laughs> we were gossiping about certain individuals, and those things would need to be cut <laughs> for reasons that you might know. <laughs> so anyway... I have all the tapes. I have all the original recordings. They're actually MP3s, and they're in multiple locations, so nobody can just grab my computer and run away with them. I took so many notes that it ended up becoming this massive 120-page document, and that was what led to, that was the collateral that created Cosmic Disclosure. I said, look at all the material we've got. Look at how amazing this stuff is. And when we brought Corey in, Originally, we thought, yeah, you know, he might be good for six episodes. We might get a 10-episode or a third. Maybe if we're lucky, we'll get a 13-episode miniseries. Corey and I sat down in the first week alone, and we knocked out like 22 episodes. 26. Okay. He remembers better than I do. It's basically like we just had to stop the camera every half an hour and then pick it up again, keep going. And lo and behold, the viewership numbers, the subscriber numbers for Gaia, which we were working with, absolutely went through the roof. It was the biggest hit they'd ever had. The subscriber numbers went crazy. It goes over 100,000 from like somewhere in the, I forget what it was, 30s, 40s, or 50s. It was a lot lower. It doubled the company, basically. And it was a very complex, weird story. It takes a lot of time and energy to understand this. So naturally, this is not something you can hit with a sneaker. This is something you've got to really dedicate yourself to to understand. It's hyper-complex. Corey knows all this stuff that other insiders told me, none of whom had come forward on their own. Later on, of course, we get Emery. And William Tompkins ends up saying the same stuff Corey's saying. This is normal. If you find a real guy, they're all going to say the same kind of stuff. So without further ado, is there a microphone somewhere for him? Do we have a microphone for Corey? Because I don't see it. <laughs> I don't want to blow his moment here. Oh, we got to get set up for it. We were going to do a little intermission. You want to take Intermission? A Intermission. My Come on, friend. I got all this momentum. <laughs> yeah, bring him up. Give it up for <laughs> David Wilcock. What's up, Corey? <laughs> Did you know when we started all this that you'd be in front of a crowd like this today? Absolutely not. Do you remember <laughs> how, how introverted I was? Yeah. When we first started shooting Cosmic, I would have to look at you. So as soon as I'd look at the camera, it was like a black hole it was sucking me in, and I just... Ugh. It's true. It's, yeah. It's bad. You and I were just talking earlier today about the original film that I shot of you that was like your pilot episode. And I still have that. Nobody's ever seen it. We just have to clean up the audio, uh, but I've already done like 80% of the work. So we probably are going to release our original interview before anybody knew who he was. And It was shot in your living room. Yeah, that's right. But we actually had some nice lighting, and it actually looks pretty good. So what was it like in those early days, Corey, when you had been telling me all the stuff that already happened to you in the past, and we'd been talking for, I don't know, three or four months, and then all of a sudden, I mean, you, you were basically out of the game, right? Let's just talk about that for a minute. It, it, explain to people... When you and I first started talking for the first three months, what were the things, what were the most recent things that had happened to you that were secret space program related? 
I was pulled back in the 90s, you know, for some, you know, uh, some groups wanted me to participate in providing them information, but at that time I was no longer a viable asset. I wasn't getting uh, the, uh, the shots that they gave us. Well, and one of the things I thought was really interesting that relates to what I was just talking about is you had said that there were ways in which you had been trained to actually detect these portals psychically. So could you describe a little more about what this work was? What were they trying to get you to do? Yes, they would use intuitive impasse. They would use three of them to triangulate portals that would open, the natural portal system. And I've described many times about how uh, the Earth and our local star are connected by an electromagnetic filament. Mm -hmm. And as the Earth spins, that electromagnetic filament is going up and down the equator and uh, going below the surface. I'm just going to freaking do it myself. <laughs> going below the surface of it's the all Earth. Good. <laughs> yeah. These these points are connecting to nodes, and these nodes can be um, a magnetic connection that it makes high up in the atmosphere, even in space. It can be on the surface of the Earth or it can be underneath, even mm -hmm. under, under the ocean. And they would have three of us triangulate where these were going to open next so they could position themselves to take advantage of, them, of the portals to travel. So some of the technology that they had, first of all, these would be like anti-gravity craft they're flying in, I assume, right? Yes. But they apparently, when, when a portal opened up, they might not be able to normally detect it with any electromagnetic signature, but psychics could. Yes, and they had technological ways of predicting where these would open, but a lot of these, um, like in the 90s, these groups that came and picked me up, they were picking me up in triangular craft that had been handed down to them. They were um, cabal-type people that had uh, access to this technology, right. but they didn't have access to all of the technology that was telling them when portals would open. It, they were flying illegally without clearance, so they mm. couldn't... Uh, get, they couldn't call in a, a location for a, uh, a portal to open. They had to f find another way. So somehow these guys were doing unauthorized trips, and if they could find one of these naturally occurring portals, they had technology that could then harness it and use it to travel somewhere else. Correct. Did you ever have an idea of what they were going to do when they got to the other side, or what was the reason why they needed to have an unauthorized trip? You sometimes would be able to extrapolate what was going on by what equipment was around, how people were dressed that were about to go through hmm. a portal, but you didn't have a need to know that type of information. So you didn't stay on the ship once they found the portal. You just found them the portal and they go off on their own. Right, and a lot of times these people wouldn't even use a ship. They, were, they would bring us to a place um, and uh, we would um, determine where a portal was going to open and then they would send a local team through on foot sometimes. They would, they would arrive, like we would give them a, a longitude, a latitude, um, and altitude. The uh, team would arrive with a remote um, set of equipment that would open up a portal. And th these hmm. would be on tripods set up around, uh, usually four, I believe. Um, and in the middle is where the, uh, of the four, tripods. Is this making sense? Are you picturing Yeah, it? I mean, this is exactly what I heard okay. from other insiders. The okay. only difference is that they apparently got it working on three instead of four. But yeah, I, I, I can't remember if it was, it was, it seemed to yep. be that they had to have four, four, three spatial connections and then a, a fourth one for a, uh, a time Even now, something. I'm learning brand new stuff, guys. We've never had this conversation before, believe right. it or not. Give them a big round of applause. <laughs> So we would give them this information and they would have teams that were in craft that would fly to this location and sometimes they would enter these portals on foot, sometimes they would drive in with regular vehicles and like I said, sometimes they would fly, depending on the, if the portal's up in the upper atmosphere, they would fly through and they've even taken submarines through them. And, and how do you feel about what the other insiders had said that you see where you're going and there's like a shimmery heat signature around the edge? That's exactly how I described it right. in the past. So obviously, guys, the trouble that we're having here is that this kind of information seems like it's sci-fi, seems like it belongs in a movie. 
And somebody who's just casually watching this online and is like, ah, oh, these guys are crazy, Corey Good is crazy. You have to understand the density of different people that have said the same thing, the density of the data and how consistent this is. We just found another one right now. Anytime I start talking to him about something new and I open up a new line, I invariably hear him say things that other people already told me that I didn't put online. So this is just another example. So that was the last time that you had had anything happen. Now another thing I remember in the early days when I was talking to you, and if we ever do go through the trouble of digging up all those original recordings and publishing them, there was a certain extraterrestrial contact that you had had, and you were very, very evasive. Like you told me basically everything I wanted to know except that you said some kind of ET group had contacted you and it was a very personal thing and you didn't want to let me know. Come on, dude. What would you do if eight foot tall bluebirds started talking to you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, well, you have to sit back and process a little while and, and wonder if you're crazy. I mean, I'm absolutely shameless. I'll make jokes about my member. So I probably would just tell everybody. <laughs> But you and I have very different personalities, so I totally get it. I'm an introvert. <laughs> yes. I'm definitely not. <laughs> you getting it all here. This is the backstage pass, okay? There's the cold cuts. <laughs> Unlike Faster Pussycat, there's no big jug back there. And there's nobody vomiting over in the, in the singing bowl. So you, why, why did you not want to talk to me about these beings? I mean, apart from, obviously, the embarrassment factor, you had told me there was some other things that were going on, that there was, it was not just like a random set of messages, it was very personal. Right, well, during the time, I was told not to share the information. But, as I've told you in the past, I had been involved in an intruder intercept and interrogation program. I'd seen many different ETs. Um, at their best and at their worst, but I'd never seen an eight foot tall bluebird being, ever. I hadn't heard anyone talk about it. So I was a bit concerned, to be honest, when it first happened, and I was really trying to figure out what was going on, because it was, uh, I mean, it was pretty much almost like a religious experience. The, um, these six density beings, you know, your third density consciousness comes into proximity of theirs and it, it affects you. So walk us through in these original experiences, how did this happen? Were you told to go out into a field and there's this br brilliant light and a craft comes down? What, what was it like? How did they reach you? Through my dreams in the beginning. And I remember the first time I, I was having a dream and for some reason there was a commercial that was popular during the time or that it came out during the time. It, was, it had a female soldier coming home um, from deployment and this huge, I don't even know what kind of dog it was, greeting her and uh, you know, jumping around all over her and greeting her. And I don't know why I was seeing that. And then all of a sudden the dog kind of morphed and turned around and was this blue bird being right in front of me. And it raised its hand up. This is not a television commercial now. This is your dream. No, this okay. is this is I was dreaming about I was dreaming about for some reason this television commercial. Oh. I don't normally dream about commercials. Okay. So <laughs> this commercial, you know, played out and this the giant dog turned around and morphed into Tier Air. And Tier Air just sat there kind of moving his mouth like this and doing his hand and I don't I'm not hearing anything but it's, I feel it's communicating with me. And that was it. I woke up and I was like, whoa. That was really, I knew it wasn't a dream, but I didn't know if someone was, you know, screwing around with my head. I'd been involved with technologies, you know, in the past, like Voice of God and others. So I knew what was out there. Right. So it was, uh, it, it, then over consecutive nights, it started visiting me again. And... Um, I started uh, being able to understand the information that was coming through. It was coming through, it was allowing me, my ego, to see it, but it was communicating with my higher self in the beginning. 
And it is very interesting. This is another thing that we've never talked about before. Um, you know, af after a while, you got to try to find how can we do something new? Because you guys have seen everything, right? I mean, like... Should we have Emery come on out? Very soon, yeah, very soon, yes. Back in the back. Yeah. I'm the MC, bro. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> I want to get to this first. I have an agenda. It's all good. So... I wanted to kind of set the record straight on this because I had started reading this book, The Law of One. It's actually a series of five books in, in 1996. And then that paved the way for this contact that I had with what Joe Mason called the dream voice, where I have these stacks of tapes on my desk. They're predicting the future very, very accurately. And it all seemed like I was in touch with the source from the Law of One material, which identifies itself as Ra. And, they, and when they were asked about the relationship between Ra and a bird, they said, yes, the bird is the best way to envision what we look like. This is in the Law of One material. The Law of One material also says that any time they're going to contact someone, they begin in dreams to reduce fear. And so you just, again, validated another aspect of this. So we do all this talking for X number of months, and then... You had had these contact experiences you didn't want to tell me about. And you had also said that there was a lot of really personal information in this, stuff that was very deep. And I'm not going to ask you to give that stuff, because I know personal, by definition, means not to be shared in front of 500 of your best friends here <laughs> and 2 million more on, on YouTube, right, when, once it's stolen. <laughs> <laughs> So the point is, this, we both kind of began in a very similar way, a telepathic contact, a dream contact, and I already had this whole body of it, Law of One information, I had all the science of it that I've put it together in, like uh, what Teresa was saying in my introduction, source field investigations, that whole book, over a thousand academic references, is just validating what's in the Law of One, really. And I say that in the acknowledgments at the end. But I didn't even need to mention the Law of One all the way through, because their model of science is so much more advanced than ours, that if you just take the clues they give you and put it together, you have an entirely new view of science and reality. And it includes this whole secret space program thing, and it includes the idea of ascension. Now, I'm kind of in flames here because 2012 had come and gone. Nothing seems to have happened. But you remember, Corey, that there was, there was a weird event in December 2014, right around the time that you and I started talking. And I'd heard about this from other insiders. And what I'd heard was that they tried to shoot something in our, just outside Earth, with a big, big particle beam weapon. There was just some argument over, had it come out of Australia, or where was it shot? Well, you remember this part, right? So why don't you tell everybody yeah. what happened there? Yeah, I was told that either the targeting system for this weapon was in Australia, and the weapon itself was in South Africa, or vice versa, that it was a two-part weapon. It was a, a targeting system in the actual uh, uh, weapons platform. That it had targeted a sphere that they had detected outside the atmosphere and that they were going to destroy it because they had been sending ships out to where they knew they were, hailing, trying to hail whoever was supposedly in these spheres. They got no response. And when you say sphere, how big are we talking? Is it like a golf ball? <laughs> no. No. The smallest ones were the size of the moon. The largest ones were the size of Jupiter. And they were somehow cloaked. It's not like these are all visible to people on Earth. Right. They were, they were out of phase more, right. more than anything. And uh, so they trained their weapon on one of these spheres and, and fired. And the sphere, using an Aikido principle, just redirected the energy right back down. And the, uh, there were, I'm told, reptilians present. There were non-terrestrials present and what we're calling deep state or cabal operatives present at this location that was destroyed. Right. And again, when you start hearing about reptilians and things like this, this is another example of something that I'd been hearing about, that there are certain types of extraterrestrials that have a reptilian physiology. The descriptions between insiders who've never spoken to each other, and I never put this stuff online, was remarkably consistent. 
I mean, incredible, way beyond the likelihood of chance. And enough people are telling you the same things. Either you're the victim of the most well-financed and vast disinformation campaign ever mounted on Earth, or Occam's razor, slice it off. They're actually telling you the truth. And so that was my conclusion, is that these guys are telling me the truth. So they not only redirected the beam back to the Earth. Oh, here's the same fly that my wife was so upset about the other day. <laughs> Now Roger, Roger doing, almost ate it. Now we're going to be doing this for the next hour. <laughs> so, not only did this beam redirect back to the base that shot it, but a far more dramatic and massive effect also took place. And could you remind everybody, in case they hadn't heard all the details of the story, what that was? Yes. At that point, a barrier went up around the Earth and the solar system that prevented non-terrestrials from a, a, a wide range of densities from being able to come or go from our solar system. So essentially, we ended up under some kind of quarantine. Mm -hmm. And this event, again, took place after you and I started talking, but right within so December 2014, you and I started talking, end of October 2014, right as we're really getting into the thick of it, that's when this thing happens. And there's this barrier that goes up around our solar system and the Earth. Now, it was at the very end of February that someone contacts you and says that they want you back into the world that you had come from before. So could you describe for us how that initial contact took place and what was the request that was given? Because you hadn't been contacted since the 90s for this portal stuff. Right. You're talking about my, my, my start meeting Gonzalez. Yep. Right. Well, first, I had met him before we were even introduced. I, I, he came to my house before I came out with all this information when I was going through all of the depression after I had the uh, needle stuck in my eye when I had a detached retina and all, all of these uh, 20 and back experiences came back and it was overwhelming, he showed up with the Mayans at my house and they helped uh, you know, mitigate the problems with, with the, the memories returning. Much, you know, a little bit later on, uh, Tier Air prepared me, told me that I was going to speak on their behalf and that I was gonna be contacted by people from my old uh, life, I guess you could say. Right. And uh, I was not at all excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> so for translating, for those who haven't heard this narrative before, when he talks about 20 and back, he's describing a very strange experience where you're taken into space, you work for 20 years, because they have time travel, they revert you back to the time you left, whatever that date was, and then they put you through this machine, takes about a week, and they age regress you back to the age you were when you left. And then they splice you in and wipe out the memory of those 20 years, and it actually works pretty well. And, and where that technology came from, I'm told, are the Nordics, that Nordics on other planets, when they're trying to liberate them, they will come in and use this 20 and back type program. They'll bring it in, and it allows them to use assets on that planet to fight for its sovereignty without breaking cosmic law. They're pulling these people out of off the Earth or off of whatever planet. They're serving in, in these programs, and then they're removing all memory of it and putting them back in time. In, in, in this. And you had said in your 20 and backs that you might have people who had come from the era of the, like the 1950s working besides people who came from the 1980s. Right. They wouldn't tell you that, but you know people from different eras... That, they have very obvious giveaways, how they move, how they just their demeanor, and how, you know, obviously how they talk. And I saw this quite a bit. And later on, after I'd been in the program for a while, I asked, are these people coming, uh, I asked one of the scientists, are these people coming from different time periods? And they said on rare occasion that right. these people were being pulled. So let's now go to the moment that you actually get brought up there again and you're 
at what you call the LOC or Lunar Operations Command in a conference room, maybe not a whole lot different than this. Not a whole lot different at all. <laughs> and you're up there on stage, Gonzalez has brought you in, and everybody in the audience starts heckling you, thinking that you're some fool. Well, well just these people up front. Oh, okay. Heck heckling yeah, me. this yeah. dude looks pretty shady right here. I don't know about him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, Gonzalez walked me through a door, walked me right up to the front of the room, and he said, stand right here. And it was, like, kind of off-centered. And I just kind of stood there and <laughs> was trying not to make eye contact. And I was wearing a NASA hat, which was a big mistake. And that's when the people started, you know, since when is NASA on the moon? You know, remove that cover. And that's, I took it off. I also had a painting on my hand right. of... Uh, a dinosaur that my daughter painted on. She wanted to do face paint, but I knew I was going to have this meeting, so I couldn't do it. And uh, they were asking why I had a reptilian on my hand. <laughs> so. so all of a sudden, what you've reported is that all of a sudden, like you imagine everybody's kind of relaxed and laughing right now, and then all of a sudden everybody goes like this in the audience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not nearly that dramatic, but there was... Well... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be dramatic. You do, yeah. But, uh, yes, everyone straightened up and leaned back, and their eyes got really big. And I looked behind me, and Tear Air was there, and the being I'd never seen before, these uh, uh, golden triangle-headed beings. Right. The wavy Very arms. Very strange looking, yeah. So, at this point from what you've described, and most of the people know the story, but there's a reason why I'm bringing this up again. The, the beings that had already been talking to you, you said in your dreams, they'd approached you before, you had a dog turn into this being in one of your dreams, and they had prepared you that you were going to have this meeting. For some reason, which is exactly what's like in the law of one, by universal law, they could not talk to these people directly. They had to use you as an instrument, as an interface telepathically. Yes, I mean, I was, they told me, repeat what we tell you exactly as we tell you. So, Which is exactly what happened in the dream I had with the being whispering to me, saying, I can't do it electromagnetically, I'm going to talk to you, and then you put it onto the tape. Yeah, it just seemed like yeah. a waste of time. You know, I, I'm standing there, they're standing there, and they could have easily communicated with these people, but they now, did they Now, didn't. how many of these spheres were in our solar system roughly at the time that this was meeting was taking place there were many 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 hundreds they had been seeing them pouring in through the sun port like portaling in through mm -hmm. the sun and coming in from out outside of the solar system they had been seeing them come in since i think around 2011 and in at the end of 2012 the that failure date supposedly they came in in mass and that's, I think that's the big thing that occurred in 2012. We just didn't necessarily get to see it. But also, everybody in the space program, even back when you were in it, and all my insiders also were telling me this, everybody's expecting at some point that the sun is going to give off an enormously bright flash of light, much brighter than usual, like a right. full halo coronal mass ejection kind of thing. Well, yes, and also, well, more so during that time period, those people were thinking that it was the return of the Anunnaki. The return, yeah. But they couldn't understand why the reptilians were so nervous. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. So um, they, the uh, military industrial complex was thinking that it was the return of, of their gods. And they were sadly disappointed. But, and, and remember now, uh, in case you guys haven't heard this already, way back in the late 1990s, 98, 99, there was this guy with a website, cyberspaceorbit.com. His name was Kent Stedman. And he was reporting multiple times of the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory satellite, or SOHO, seeing these gigantic planet-sized objects coming in that he called sun cruisers. And a lot of people got confused back then because there would be a line across the dot. But that's because it was so bright that it blew out the CCD sensors in the camera and created a pixel fault that made that line horizontally. So what you're actually seeing is a big planet-sized dot. They're literally the size of the other planets. And they would come in through the sun. And again, it's sad that we didn't have YouTube back then. We didn't have anywhere near the number of people watching this. Because I was into it back in the late 90s. And this stuff was happening all the time. 
And many times when these things would come in, NASA would all of a sudden, oops, SOHO has had a malfunction. And it doesn't work, and oops, the camera shut off. And oops, now we're going to have to reboot it. But there were enough times that they caught the thing on film. But I only saw maybe, you know, 10, 20 examples of these planet-sized objects. But what you're saying is that there were hundreds of them in our solar system. They couldn't figure out what was going on at first. They were pouring in, you know, the Earth is in a very small area on this side of the sun, and it's traveling around. You know, these spheres were everywhere. And they were positioning themselves from the sun out with the different size spheres were positioning themselves in a way that like they were some sort of a, a resonance device. You know, waves were coming in, coming from the sun and from the outer cosmos. And as they were coming in, these um, spheres were, cut, were vibrating and baffling the energy that was coming in because they were protecting us and the planet. It, we weren't ready for it yet. So a lot of these insiders that I had, their information was really no more recent than the 80s because they'd been out for a while and then they come to me after 20 years of thinking about it or more. And back then they were thinking that the sun was going to do its flash at the end of 2012. And they were seeing things like these two timelines that fluttered together into one at the end of 2012. They have the guys going through Montauk and the portals and then they hit this wall and they turn into particles. And then after 2012 they, they have this God consciousness experience. And so I'm looking at this and I'm saying it sure looks like the solar flash is going to happen at the Mayan calendar end date. So by this point, it's come and gone. 2012 is come and gone. And did these guys in the audience want to ask these beings through you what the heck happened with 2012? Why didn't the sun do its flash? They had, they, they asked a number of questions. Uh, some of them were about actually the law of one. Some were asking about... Um, a soul trap when we die. Right. And uh, some of them were asking highly technical questions. I did not even know what I was saying back when I was responding. So, I mean, I, have no, I had no base of reference to be able to tell you what I was talking about. I had no idea. But there was a point made, and this is already in the episode, so I'm not leading him, okay, for those keyboard warriors again who are going to try to think that they're amazing because they found a mistake or something. But one of the things that you did say, and I just want to get to this because we're going to bring Emery up in just a minute here, is that they were asked about what were the spheres really doing. And so just to really cut to the chase, it appeared, right, that the spheres were holding off this solar flash. Right. They were attenuating the energy. Okay. Man, the, the way I describe it compared to the way they describe it to me, there's a major gulf. Um, I've described the electromagnetic filaments that, you know, occur. So they, they break for it down. For portals, yeah. For portals. So um, they, I'm sorry, what did, I, I got lost in the. This is what happens yeah. when you're 113 years old. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Give them a big round of applause, everybody. <laughs> What was the, was the bottom line of the spheres that they were holding off the solar flash until we were all ready as a planet? Right. There was some sort of electromagnetic attenuation that was occurring that was preventing our, st our star from completing an electromagnetic arc connection to the other stars as this energy was passing through them, through the cosmic web. It, it prevented that from occurring. Yes. All right, so another thing that's very bizarre here is that some kind of cosmic Aikido principle, as you said, they shot this sphere, the sphere shoots back, blows up this base, which might have been Pine Gap in Australia or something like that. There's a few Area 51s in Australia I've heard about, way out in the desert. And then this barrier goes up around the solar system, and ETs can't come in, and ETs can't go out. Now, if the barrier is there, and the solar flash is going to happen, and there's some really nasty reptilian ETs in our solar system, what's going to happen to them if they can't get out of here when the solar flash goes off? They're going to be caught up in the effects of these energies. And I have to say that the synchronicity, you talking about people 
trying to travel p past 2012 in these portals and then running into this cosmic consciousness. Um, I don't know if you heard last night, I was talking with Roger, the Anshar recently told me they were describing the energies that are coming um, through our solar system right now and how incredibly powerful they are. They refer to them as the cosmic consciousness. Mm. They've, they said it was the logos of the galaxy, right. basically a Christ consciousness that was coming back to um, cause a great revealing within us and within the planet to where we all judge ourselves. Right, and I'm going to go through this tomorrow in the workshop, um, the prophecies of ascension, the science of ascension, interplanetary climate change, all the signs that our solar system is like a capacitor building up energy. And similar to electromagnetics, if you build up enough charge, you're going to get a static shock, right? If you scuff your feet on a wool carpet and then you touch the doorknob, ah! It's because you've built up all this energy charge in your body and it has to discharge. So it appears, right, like the sun is going to have some kind of discharge like this. Correct, yeah. yeah. So the effect on these negative ETs, apparently they have built a major headquarters in our solar system, correct? Correct. And the, they're afraid, these beings are afraid of being exposed to this cosmic consciousness. So they would have gotten out of here if they could have. Right. And the reptilians even... Uh, I was brought to a meeting to where they were willing to hand over all of their underlings to, to betray everyone to be given safe passage outside of the solar system because they did not want to be here when this judgment or whatever happens. And then they, that... they were, they're going to be forced to judge themselves as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is very exciting because it it lends so much more depth and credibility to the ancient prophecies that we encountered that I'm going to be going through tomorrow. There's so much there that crosses over with, with Corey now being like the modern Enoch. If you look at the book of Enoch, Enoch was brought up into the heavens and became a messenger where the bad ETs on earth were asking to be saved by the good ETs called the Elohim, and they were rejected. And this is what led to the Atlantean flood and because the people here on earth we call the Cabal or the Illuminati are the descendants of those ETs that lost out on that deal and had the flood, they think that our God, the Abrahamic God in the Western traditions, is evil because he voted for the flood, voted to kill these people off. So there's this ongoing 12,000-year-old grudge that they have that still hasn't been properly resolved. So to really kind of hit the nail on the head here, Obviously, when I started to talk to you and all the other insiders, everybody who was real had things that were precisely described in the law of one material, including materials of technology, bases on the moon, all this kind of stuff. Did anybody in this crowd ask about the law of one? Yes. Yes, they asked if he, if Tyr Air was the raw from the law of one. And what was his answer? I am Rao Tyr Air. And the beginning of every statement they make in the Law of One starts with the phrase, I am Ra. And it was pronounced Ra by, by her, Carla, when she was speaking, but Rao is Ra, right? Right, that's, they, they say Rao. Okay. Yeah. So what's so weird is that right away I knew, okay, avian, Horus, right, Egyptian, this is, this is the Law of One contact coming back. But I wasn't buying it. I know, but then yeah. I, in the kitchen, remember this part, in the kitchen I asked, is Corey in contact with Ra of the Law of One? And I heard three words, go outside now. That's all I got. And I asked again, I hear, go outside now. Like this. This is what it sounded like. Three times I asked the same thing, and they did not give me anything else. So I say, okay, fine, I'll go outside. I walk outside, and there is this gigantic rainbow over the valley of Los Angeles. And it was, and so this is the funny thing is they don't really answer the question, but yet I knew the rainbow was the answer. And in the law of one, they explain how they have to preserve free will. They can't really tell you, but they can make a strong hint. So again, it's like that answer was like a strong hint. So now I have, and you guys know this, of course, the law of one is exceedingly complex. 106 question and answer sessions where he jumps all around. It's very, very complex material. 
to really dig deep into the meat of this thing, you actually have to read the law of one, understand the philosophy, that they're talking about ascension, they're talking about these events coming to play, and the beings that you start to talk to seem to have this encyclopedic knowledge of the law of one. It was crazy, like they had the book there and they're just flipping through it. So now, guys, without further ado, I want to bring Emery Smith up to the stage. Let's get him out here. Put this man to work. <laughs> he has his parachute on. <laughs> Vote for me in 2020. <laughs> Watch it, I got my essential oils with me. <laughs> Who was there last night with me? Raise your hands. <laughs> you can't make that up, can you? Some good stuff. Yeah, I heard that you guys had some very interesting things taking place last night. It's the norm, you know. You're at my <laughs> house, you're going to see these things running around. Now, it took a long time to get you to come forward. And it's very interesting for me because... Everybody kind of heard your story. There's a lot of love in this room right now. Oh, yeah. I gave everyone the high five except, you know, <laughs> my two colleagues here. Now, we're, we're unfolding a cosmic narrative here. And you, like Corey, have had in-person contact with extraterrestrials. Now, we kind of overlooked this when we were doing Cosmic Disclosure, but I've also had contact the whole time. It's just that for me, it was always telepathic. But the one thing that I can tell you guys is that every time that I would receive the contacts where I wouldn't know what the heck I was saying, the voices just come, I'm just letting myself talk, but I don't listen to it. And you have to be very deep in meditation so that you're forgetting each word as it comes out. Because it's so slow, and your mind is going so fast that the time between words is so long, you can't even tell what the sentence is. And both of you guys have reported contact with ETs and telepathic stuff. And one of the things that would always happen to me is I get this incredible bliss sensation. In fact, I had to invoke the bliss sensation first and then be in this really, really deep trance before the words would come in, where later on I'd transcribe them and they would predict the future just like somebody's reading pages out of a book. You so, have to have that frequency before you make contact. That's why you did that. You know, then you're at that level of no ego and you're ready to make contact like we did last night. You have to escape from that, this, this realm here and drop all your shields down and say, I'm just the same as you, 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 and you. And we're ready to make contact. And that's what to happen. That's what you're explaining right now is getting on that frequency level to accept that. And Corey, you reported that these beings like when Tyrion was first talking to you, that you would have a very powerful bliss state. Could you describe that for us just with a little more verbal decoration? Yeah. I'm, Since sometimes I, I'm, I'm he literally so answers with one word. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep, nope, and maybe. Okay. So <laughs> the, the question was, what's it like? Um, Can you feel bliss? your underpants? Yes. yes. Okay, let's start with that. Okay. So, some of these beings, we learned very quickly during interrogations, a lot of these beings, before they communicate or come in contact with a human being, they manipulate your state of mind. So, uh, a very gross looking ET can project a image of an angel of light coming into the room with you and deceive you and interact with you. Now. So there's that type of them um, making you feel blissed out. They'll make you feel blissed out to make you feel all uh, religious, kind of a religious feeling. Now, the higher density beings, it is just their consciousness vibration affecting you. Your, your vibration is, is vi you, it starts vibrating a little faster, you know, and you feel the effects of that. And so just could you describe the emotional feelings, like just give us some adjectives and, and some descriptive language about what does it actually feel like? The words, the words don't work, you know, for it. When, I'm, when I've been in positions to where tear air is communicating through me, I can't even see who I'm communicating with because tears are just coming 
constant, constant. I mean, my shirt's wet. I mean, it's, uh, and I'm not crying. I'm not feeling, but I'm, I have such, I feel like, you know, your a cable can uh, handle a certain current uh, before it burns up. It feels like it's, I've, the current's been turned up extremely high. Now, Emery, one of the most fascinating things for me is when you described being in an alien autopsy room and that you had certain beings come in and assist you in the autopsy. Now, this is like Emery's greatest hits. Some of you guys might have heard this, but I really want this to be out here again. <laughs> so could you describe for us, first of all, uh, just give us one of the beings, or maybe more than one of the beings, that you were talking to in the OR, and how did this communication take place, and what kind of communication was it? This will take 30 minutes to answer. Perfect. I'll be right back. Go for it. <laughs> Drop the mic. He dropped the mic. Damn. Yeah! <laughs> Just like when you come home from work with your family, you might be in a great mood, or you might not be. But the fact is, because your frequency is at that mood and that emotion, you transmit that frequency. So you could actually turn your whole household into a big cluster real quick if you're really angry and you bring that energy home and we infect each other with it. So the same thing with working with extraterrestrials who are very telepathic and very communicative this way using energies, you have to reset yourself and you have to bring yourself down to an egoless level that you're willing to work with someone today because the first thing that's going to happen in the first 10 seconds is they're going to know if you're upset. They're going to know pretty much everything about you and you have to deal with that, which is fine. In my life, I have obviously no more secrets. But the best thing about it was going up, knowing that this colleague of yours, who is extraterrestrial, looks like a human, maybe a little, little different, maybe the ears are a little bit different, the eye set's a little bit different, but for the majority of it, they volunteered to be here, or they were captured to come here, and they volunteered to stay, <laughs> because they were once us, and they have more compassion than all of us put together. But we are them, remember that. Our DNA is in uh, the majority of the extraterrestrials that I have been involved with. But getting back to the question, I'm sorry, that was just the scientific part now. Describe I'm, I'm a, for uh, us some of like who you saw, what did they look like exactly, and, and more of the emotional verbiage of what was it like to communicate with them. Did they talk with their mouths or how was it going? Yeah, they can communicate with their mouths or special devices, but for the most part it's tele uh, telepathy. And telepathy is a language, by the way. You have to have, like I said, with your emotion and everything, you, when you project something, and I'm upset and I'm walking in the room, I'm not gonna work today, and I said, hello. Tell them. It's more like, hello! <laughs> because they read the emotion, not the transmission. <laughs> because they're reading the entire system of, of your sta how stable you are, and you know, they know your chemical levels and everything, so they know they're, they can smell things that we can't smell, or we can smell them subliminally. <laughs> but, but at the same time, you have to have this set mindset when you go in there. So these uh, ETs uh, that I was working with mostly were human looking. Um, They're very tall, uh, tall whites I call them. And they are very compassionate and very, very funny. So when we're sitting here working on something, and it's really nice because when they say, oh, we're gonna take this and do this and you know, you need to do this, it's already like within seconds. So it's like fluid movement of what you're doing at the operating room table there. Hey, continue. <laughs> and that being said is they can see a little bit into your thought processes before you make the move, which is really interesting. So if I'm about to grab something, they already know that I was gonna grab that, and it's like, no, and like, you're about to think it, but you're like, no. Like, they already called me out. Like, they, they're a couple of, like, seconds ahead of me, you know? And it was really fun, uh, except for the part on Friday nights where I'm, like, gonna go home and have fun for the weekend. They know what I'm doing that weekend. And they're laughing, <laughs> Emery, or <laughs> 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 taking the girl out to the movies this night. Oh, okay, well, 
So there is no secrets, nothing. And that's how it's going to be here in the future. There will be no secrets with anyone. <laughs> Everything that you see me think will be right here on that screen for the universe to see, and people will be held responsible for what's done here on this planet. So since your presence has a tendency to occupy the space when you arrive... <laughs> I'm just a regular guy with a regular doll. I, I don't think you were here when I was doing the opening intro, but I was talking about meeting rock stars. And I was talking about... Oh, see? This is perfectly normal behavior. This is, uh, this is a I'm serum. He has I'm to ingest to a certain a of... serum to not shapeshift. That's classified. Shame on you. I knew that backpack had something to do with this. Okay, uh, Corey has lost his mic, so he probably needs a new battery. That's why I always... Oh, okay, there we go. he's got it. Okay. <laughs> We're good. So anyway, I was talking about meeting rock stars. And how if you're all, oh my God, wow, it's so amazing, you know, you'll get like 30 seconds tops. Security. But if you're totally relaxed, <laughs> if you're totally relaxed and you don't really care, and you're like, hey man, what's going on? Then they'll talk to you for an hour. Right. And so I'm trying to give people here, th there's a reason why I did all the things that I did. Everybody was like, David spent 20 minutes talking about meeting rock stars. No, I was listening to you last hour and a half, yeah. Okay, good. Because so you wouldn't invite me up on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I we wanted can, to make can, sure Corey can, had a chance to talk. Oh. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I just know how these things go. <laughs> There's a strategy. You want to roast, we can roast. <laughs> <laughs> My point in bringing this up was that I think a lot of us here, whether, whether you think you're ready or not, okay, I believe for myself the reason why I was able to get this telepathic contact with these beings is I might be there for an hour and I am talking robotically like this. And I, don't, and I know that when I transcribe this later on that it's going to be this amazing stuff that predicts the future and has these beautiful messages from extraterrestrials for me and I'll see these beings in white robes and I'll, you know, because sometimes I'll report what I'm seeing as I'm hearing the stuff. And they were Nordics, for the most part. My point is, if I had had that response like fans do when they go backstage at a rock concert, oh my God, extraterrestrials are talking to me. Holy crap, what are they saying? I'm interested. If I, if I got into that state, it's immediately going to break the contact. So the point is you have to kind of not really, you don't want to see them as anything that special. You want to just be really relaxed, really nonchalant, so that you can stay bored. You can stay disinterested. You just let the thing happen. You let the communication happen. So Emery, given the fact that you've had a lot of this type of telepathic experience, how do you think that what I just said would apply to people here in terms of getting the chance to meet extraterrestrials, what is the set that they have to be ready for? I think the most important thing first is to really come to reality that we're not alone. And I know most of you here are like that, except for a couple of you agents. I see you. <laughs> My people are watching you. And what that means is you can't have any fear because if we want to go to another country and, and learn about them, and just because we have a language barrier, that's okay. Okay, just because we can't talk to dolphins don't mean they're conscious. Right? Don't mean they're not conscious. I mean, they're not conscious, right. I'm sorry, that doesn't mean they're not conscious. You know, everybody would have flamed you on YouTube if I hadn't fixed that one. Thank you, Dave. Dave, <laughs> Dave, anything I write or anything I do, he, you know, checks everything out, makes sure I don't get hammered out there because everyone wants to say something bad. But getting out there, which these two have been through, I'm, I'm the newbie. Getting back to this, so no fear is the biggest thing. It's just saying, hey, and saying it out loud and, and actually projecting that like when we pray and say, hey, you know, I'm ready to make contact and I'm not fearful of it, you know, no matter what that is. So please show yourself in the most safe and effective way that that can happen for you. 
uh, for us and also safe and effective for them. So when they do come, because now, as you know, since the 50s and 60s and 70s, craft just don't come down here now like they were seen all the time because of these neutrino light detectors and devices we have up there to destroy any type of craft that come in, right? And that, that is a deterrent, but they are advanced enough to holographically image themselves or project themselves or bilocate themselves, especially interdimensional beings. That's the other thing. There's so many different types of beings. Everyone's like, oh, what's the you know, best one you've seen? Was that the octopus one Dave said? You know, was <laughs> with the cyclops eye? No. It's, a, it's like, yeah, of course we phantasmically like those kind of things, but most of the part, there are these five-star beings, two arms, two heads, and I mean, two <laughs> Really? You just let Oops. it out. Two arms, two legs, and a head. Some have two heads. <laughs> no pun intended. But what I'm getting at <laughs> is we have to, well, no, there's conjoint twins. I'm talking, you guys are horrible. I'm a scientist, guys. You know what a conjoint twin is? Okay, they have, sometimes you have no... Emory idea. Smith, the man with two brains. <laughs> oh, guys, this is going on Comedy Central Live at night. But that's how we have to prepare ourselves that way. And meditation's really good. And not getting caught up in all the negativity of the world, because it's always there. Okay, let's focus on the positivity. And you know how the positivity hums? Uh, how the positivity comes? It starts with you. You guys have to start thinking this way, because what happens, Dave, when we get a good collective together and we all start thinking the same way? We can change. It's, it's called a cult, dude. <laughs> I was trying to push your morphogenic field book, but okay. It's not Kool-Aid anymore. We got green tea in the back. People were concerned about food coloring, and they didn't like the sugar, so... I'm thirsty again. <laughs> so that's how we do it. So we, get out, we went out there last night. We blessed the land. We did a 30-minute puja. You guys like that? Yeah. There's certain areas on the planet that are contaminated with bad karmatic things, like a lot of death happened. And since I didn't know the area very well, you know, we bring someone out, a pujari, and he comes out uh, from the Hindu temple here in Denver, a friend of mine. And then we do this nice, beautiful blessing with all the fruits and the coconuts and vegetables and we pass them out the flowers. And we say, okay, ETs, we actually you know, bless this land. We did all this stuff. We had some amazing contact, but I usually do these things over like six or eight hours in one day from 6 p.m. to like 3 a.m. We only had three hours. And after midnight, it started like getting pretty heated. Olivia started doing her little thing there and they started floating in. But the thing is, you have to first make that effort to say, you know, you're not going to sit here, oh, when are they coming? Are they coming here? Are they here? Why, why, don't, you, why don't you actually talk and, and consciously put your energy into the universe, show them who you are, say it either out loud or, you know, make an intention. We had the nice bowl out there. Remember that big 24-inch singing bowl? Did you like that tone? It cleanses everything, gets people on the right tonality because like Dave said, you have to be of the right tonality to actually communicate. And that sometimes takes time. Well, and I heard from somebody else that a certain number of people said, F this, I'm out of here. And then after they left, that's when all the cool stuff started to happen. Well, they always make sure that uh, those bad guys leave and the good people that stay get to see some nice things. <laughs> and that's really honestly true. We've had many expeditions around the world, CE5s with you know, 30 to 500 people. And when these people throw their temper tantrums, because you know, they want to go and go, wait, it, oh, that's, that's a real UFO. If you're out there to see Shamu, this ain't SeaWorld, sorry. <laughs> and that's what people come out there. They have the wrong ego intention, because they're like, well, I'm just here you know, to see this, you know, uh, you know, see something so I can take a picture of it and sell it to the National Choir for 1200 bucks. Trust me, it's happened. That's not the intention you have to have if you want to be elevated in consciousness and communicate with people that are a little bit more elevated than we are consciously. I mean, they're not chopping their heads off. You know, they're not like hating each other, fighting over material things. But they were once us, and they have compassion for us. And guess what? Because of all of you, 
we're finally going to get there. All right. Emory Smith. <laughs> Corey, I know that you've had various, very specific coachings from the beings about what are the things that we need to do to be ready for this cosmic evolutionary leap, which includes, of course, direct contact with them. You've had Anshar telling you that they were going to start making in-person contacts with people in the future. So could you give us some of the protocols of what they said would be necessary if the people in this audience, let's say, want to be among the first who are going to get those in-person contacts like what you guys have had already. Sure. First of all, these positive beings, before they manifest in front of you or show themselves in front of you, they go into a, well, to us, we, would, we think of meditation and communicating with our higher selves as this whole process. But fourth density, they're, they're really already connected. They and their higher self communicate with your higher self first. And then your, first, your higher self communicates back whether you get any uh, in-person visitations or um, any communication at all or what type and, and, and how it should begin. And usually it begins in dream work. What about things like synchronicity, seeing number patterns, stuff like that? Right, yeah. One of the interesting things about the Anshar is that that's how they communicate with us. They, they and other beings from the future, even, are here with us right now. There's an interesting time or interesting event they are able to use, like the Anshar, their technology are these chairs that they sit in, and it focuses their consciousness and interacts with space-time, and it is like they are floating right there, almost like you know, an angel you know, in, in the room. I, I sat in the chairs and, and experienced the technology, and they will follow a family line for many, many generations, watching how they develop and the cycles that the that they go through and they will communicate and they communicate with people they give them downloads people have, many have been uh, experiencing downloads lately they it, uh, let people know they're on the right path with synchronicities kind of like dropping breadcrumbs well don't you think it's interesting how many times when you really do your homework that the great inventors who have made some of the most important breakthroughs in our technology say that they got their inventions in dreams or downloads. Yeah. So to, if, if it starts with dream contact, are there certain character qualities, are there certain practices that we could have here that would help us to be ready for the actual in-person, the really yes. gee whiz <laughs> stuff? Beings who are coming down and, and visiting people face-to-face uh, -face during the 30s, 40s, and 50s. The consciousness level back then and even now, when these beings come and visit the average ego person, they begin to get a Christ complex. <clears throat> it happens over and over and over, and the most humble people would begin to, why are they coming to me? I must be special. What's so special about me? Then they go introspective in the wrong way. What they want is for us to go introspective in the right way, to deal with... Um, our personality distortions that uh, uh, that we haven't dealt with yet. Those personality distortions are usually what stands in the way when the higher self communication occurs between the other being and you. They're like, oh no, this person has a distortion towards this. If they have an in-person uh, communication, then you know it's going to lead. It's going to be detrimental to them. So, based on what Emery was saying about like you know, being angry or something, w would that be classified as a personality distortion that would have impacted his communication with these beings in the it's, OR? It's more of a, I guess, a symptom of a personality distortion. Why, why is the person um, not, not in control? Or why are they having uh, agitation? What was their trigger? You know, you got to trace all of that back through all of the painful, unpleasant genesis 
you know, you getting angry is just uh, a symptom of, of the wider problem they want you to deal with. So one of the, another thing that, I, that I'd like to, you know, put on the record here, uh, because the format of Cosmic was only that I could ask you questions, I couldn't really share anything, um, is that in my telepathic contacts that really were very active between 1990, the end of 96 through 2000 is when I really was getting most of this stuff happening. Uh, and as my as I became more public, I became very concerned about like all the hate I was receiving on the internet and how it could cloud my mind and make the information tainted somehow because I didn't have that sort of childlike jubilation and glee about my life anymore. And so I was afraid of doing the work anymore because if you have that kind of negative influence in your head when you're doing it, it can really get the wrong results. So... Or you can be deceived by what you think is a positive being that you're in contact with, even. Right. So when, when people start to have a sense of being a savior, this kind of thing, I equate that to the starstruck thing that you get when you meet a rock star. Because part of it is, oh, my God, I'm so special. Oh, my God, I'm backstage. I'm meeting one of the gods of our society. This guy's on TV. I've seen him so many times. I've, I love his music, you know. And that's what you don't want. And in the same sense, like I don't even talk about the fact that I had these contacts for the most part because I don't want to try to steer people into seeing me as being different. But it appears now that I'm at a point where I'm being asked in my dreams very concisely and consistently that I need to talk about this. So I want to point out something, that, a very interesting parallel between all three of us and what we've had happen to us. You got to understand when I was doing these readings that I was getting pages and pages of, of direct speaking documentation, speaking ultimately in a pretty plain way. Like in the beginning, it was very cryptic, but it got a lot more easy to understand as time went on. But they never let up on me. They never stopped criticizing me about being too afraid. They didn't like my diet. They wanted me to eat a whole different way. All this kind of stuff happened. And I mean, yeah, be look careful at what you wish for. Look at Corey Good's body now compared to where he was when we started the show. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So I'm seeing this parallelism here, and when we're looking at this solar flash that's coming our way, what were you told, Corey, about what we need to do to be prepared for this event? What, what did they instruct people about how to be ready for this thing? Well, it went back to the Blue Evian message to, um, you know, process your karma, to forgive yourself, forgive others, because it all comes down to <clears throat> the fact that all energy has mass. And when you have these traumas or emotional scars, they have mass. And they act as anchors that hold you to third density this cosmic consciousness that's coming through that's causing us to judge ourselves and to be judged, those, we need to be at a point to where they, they pass through us. There's no, resist, there's no electrical resistance. It, 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 we're, we're conductors. If we have, have not dealt with these things, then we're, we're not gonna conduct the energy. It's not gonna pass through us. It's going to burn up the wire. Well, again, this is a very fascinating real-time discovery because in all these years of readings of which I have, you know, many hundreds of pages total of all the things that were said, which I was supposed to be sharing with people and now I'm going to finally start doing it, but I, I had suppressed it for a long time, basically because I wanted to build credibility in the scientific arena because people really don't like channeling unless they're up open to it. They think, oh my God, you just made all this stuff up. And, oh, those time travel stories, you just made all that stuff up. Well, I have witnesses. I have people. I, I did a business with these readings from 98 to 2005. I had 500 clients. I had some amazing things happen. If the client was ready for it, certain people would get stuff. Like, for example, there was one lady where the beings described the lyrics. They quoted from her poems and songs. And I didn't even know that she wrote songs. They literally quoted the poems and then explained to her what the subconscious reasons were for why she wrote them. And so she was literally sobbing on the phone. And one of the things I had to train myself to do 
is to not get out of trance when people totally lose it on the phone, to stay in this robotic consciousness, you know, and I mean, the voice could get fast. Like, if I really got into it, it would be coming out faster than I could possibly talk normally, and just perfect transcribing. If you transcribe it, it's flawless sentence structure. It was very normal for people to have that kind of an experience. Emery, getting back to you for a minute now. No, don't laugh. Come on now. I'm, I'm trying to give everybody a chance. <laughs> it's interesting that you had reported that it was called a spiritual mass because over and over again, we never talked about this, the beings reported karma as a gravitational well on your timeline. And what they also said was the arrow of time points in the direction you're facing so most people are stuck in a circuit. They're like in a loop where they keep, they think that they're going forward into the future, but they're really going through a circle and there's this gravity well on the circle that keeps pulling them back. And until you clear that karma, you're basically repeating the same lessons in life over and over again. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. So Emery, based on your experience of seeing not only your own in-person contact with ETs and telepathic experiences, but actually facilitating this for others. How, do people, how does the karma stand in the way of somebody actually getting these contacts? I believe that a lot of the emotional stress we carry is programmed from something else. So there is no good or bad that you did. It's a program. You look at that and you judge yourself. And what I've learned from them is that doesn't exist unless you manifested it. So that led me, uh, leads me to the observation that, you know, we're all karmatically responsible because we're actually all connected. We're all one. It's all of our responsibility. I am David Wilcock. Well, then why are you over there? I'm bi-locating. I'll teach you that later. Fair enough. But we're, we all share the same field, same field, same energy in a different way. Of course, we all look different and are different races and gender. But for the most part, what I learned from them is that that's just a program when you think or, or you're upset or whatever, and we've been installed with this. There's many planets out there that started the same time we did, but they're completely hundreds of thousands of years more advanced than us because they didn't have this crazy 300 major corporation cabal killing Tesla and Stubblefield so we can get these anti-gravitic and zero-point energy devices out. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> But well, just, just one thing that you said that I want to make sure isn't misunderstood. I'm not really you. <laughs> no, it wasn't that. That I understand. Just maybe 2%. We're looking at the idea of the ultimate arbiter of truth, the ultimate arbiter of good or bad, right? And you say there is no good or bad, but really, let's just be more clear. And I want to see if you agree with me, because this is what's in the law of one. It's what my readings would also teach people. There's only one of us here. You kind of just said that about me. 100%. Right? So because of this, the law of one is really, really big on what they call the first distortion of the law of one. You see this term over and over again. You're like, what the hell is first distortion? They use it like hundreds of times. And then it explains the first distortion is free will. The universe will allow you to pick up a gun and shoot somebody and kill them, that might very well be allowed, but then you will have to come back in another lifetime, or maybe within that lifetime, and have somebody do the same thing to you. And because that other person is you and there's only one of us here, there is an absolute karmic balance for actions that infringe on free will. So obviously, the goal is for us to learn how to always be positive and forgiving and supportive to one another so that we're not creating these needless experiences that are going to have to come back into our own life and, and give us these very painful things. Would you agree with that, Emery? Yeah, I do. I mean, we're all at a different level of education in this karmatic spiritual value of astral state. Some are in preschool, some are already graduated. But the thing is, 
don't forget, that's a part of you. My little preschool friend here is part of me. So oh, I gotta, speak for I yourself. I gotta catch up. And then, and then, you know, my PhD here is also at a different level. So I gotta balance these two guys. Well, see, and, he's and the guy mean. that's gotta write the check at so, the end of this thing. I think that's why that happened. They're inside. <laughs> so we're, we're only as fast, you know, as our slowest runner, we say in the military, when we're all running. So we have to do that. So we have to pick each other up. We have to take everyone together on this because we're all one. Does that answer it? Yeah, very good, very good. Give him a big round of applause. <laughs> so we are now in the final 15 minute window before we're gonna do this meditation. And this is a very important part of what we're here for. And I wanna hand it back to Corey now um, since he's relieved himself in the bathroom, he's probably going to be ready for everything he needs to do here. I, I was counting on that intermission. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't get one with me. It just goes. It's okay. I have a thing back here. A bucket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I've been using. <laughs> Gotta Let, improvise. Let's talk. I mean, I, I could do the science and all this stuff, and maybe I'll insert some of that as we go. But could you explain, Corey, why... When you're doing an event called Dimensions of Disclosure and we're talking about wanting to have full disclosure and wanting to get this information out to the public, why would we need to focus on something like a group meditation? What's the underlying agenda that these beings told you about why that matters? Well, it goes back to we are all one, but this illusion of separation, the only way that we can, I guess, come together is through the mass consciousness. The more we learn about the power of our mass consciousness, the co-creative ability of our mass consciousness, and understand that, yes, at one point, some being wanted to understand what, uh, you know, wanted, wanted to, to, to have this experience, and it, it divided into all of these individual um, beings. So... I, I just got off again. I... Can you feel your underpants? <sighs> I tell you what, I, well, I was so excited about having the event here because I wasn't going to have to drive or travel, but we ended up traveling down to Dallas because my stepdad being ill, and we drove back right before this, so we're all like, pretty exhausted, so my brain is shutting off a little bit. Why meditation? Okay, meditation. <clears throat> This is our opportunity to get together and focus on one intent for our co-creative consciousness to manifest. The, and I said this earlier today, the biggest trick that the cabal pulled over us was taking away our knowledge of our co-creative abilities, and then they started to manipulate it through media and, and other control systems and they trick us into using our co-creative abilities to manifest a negative reality. And this is us taking back that power and using our magic to manifest a positive reality. Somebody from the audience, Corey, uh, came up to me after my talk yesterday, or no, it was actually at the dinner. It was at the dinner. And um, he brought up something from way back when we first started doing Cosmic that I'd forgotten about. And it was something that Tompkins touched on as well. You were told that these so-called Draco reptilians that are here on Earth had created some kind of mind control mass system that affects how everybody's mind and heart and spirit is working. And you were also told that at some point that system would break. So could you go into that a little bit about that story of what is this mind control system and what are we expecting is gonna happen when it breaks? Yes, it's, uh, it is a mixture of technology as well as the, the way the earth, the electric, electricity travels through the earth through the ley lines. They disturbed the natural ley lines and the way energy travels through the earth naturally, they, they diverted it. And uh, 
at the same time, and, and that the way that the energy was passing through the earth before allowed us to be more psychically in tuned and, and communicating with each other and also have more access to higher self uh, type, I guess, technology. They wanted to remove that from our consciousness. They didn't want us to know about it. So that affecting the, the, the grids had that effect on us. And then they also had added to that technology that was in space and also on Earth, connecting through those grid lines that affect our consciousness and keep us asleep. And from what I've been told, since the spheres came and the energies have increased, the technology doesn't hardly work. They've got it turned up all the way just to have a, a, a small effect on the consciousness of humanity right now. And Emory, that sounds a lot like what you were just saying, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm more scientific. I, I think about like scalar infotometry because of the devices I was, you know, introduced to, and this might be a reverse engineering of what they have done because the science he's talking about is real. It's real science, and it makes sense. Um, I don't know about the whole Draco thing, but I agree with what you're saying because it's already happened and it's happening. And I really believe that this meditation and things that we do cohesively with a good collective really breaks that field. Because it, remember, it's a field of energy. We're all energy. Yeah, I think also what has had an effect is that there are a lot of star seeds that their mission is to come back and reactivate these grids. And uh, uh, even people in this room have been going to um, sacred sites and trying to reactivate them uh, and uh, uh, set that circuit back up uh, to, to work properly again through the ley lines. <laughs> there is no try. Only do. <laughs> Slow down there, Turbo. <laughs> now, you were told, though, Corey, that at some point the, there would be a decisive breakdown of that system from even being able to do what it was doing, that it would just cease to work and that there would be some kind of a sudden effect, sudden change in people's consciousness. Could you describe that? Yes, it's multi-layered. It, um, it will, it, it, it's gonna be like coming off of a drug all of a sudden for everyone. It's, uh, it's, when, it's been a, it affecting our consciousness. All of a sudden, um, it's like uh, you hear you begin to hear things more clearly. You receive a signal more clearly. Um, it's, I don't, it's affected our ability to receive this information. And, and in the beginning, it's going to be overload. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a major headache in the beginning. Now, you had also described how in the secret space program, they had these craft. They fly people out into this interstellar cl cloud that our solar system is drifting into and two different types of things would happen depending on who you are. Could you go through that again real quick? Well, what they did is they flew out to these gas clouds, plural. There were numbers of them uh, that the Earth passes through, then goes through a clear patch, and then passes through you know, different densities of these clouds. But they went out to these clouds, uh, nebulous clouds, which are just energy, and they measured it. And while they were out there, they noticed that it was having a, a psychological uh, effect on the crew. Well, they documented it, and you know how scientists, they have to repeat it. So they, when I was in the programs, they would actually take our own people and, you know, people like doing data entry. Yeah, they do data entry on ships. Uh, they would put them in a room, several of them, to do data entry, and if they've psychologically profiled them all, they know everything about them, and they would put them in and watch them. And these people are working, they just they have no idea what's going on, and then they begin to pipe in this energy. And the people that were very positive, uh, moral, would become blissed out and, you know, almost high. And the people that were of a negative polarity would... Uh, do the opposite, become extremely agitated and uh, uh, unpleasant. So, Emery, do you think this is part of the reason why 
when you do these CE5s that some people get so triggered that they actually become angry and they just storm off? Yeah, they have that kind of program there that they can't accept that. Uh, it's happened millions of times where craft would come in, fly in, and you've heard about this in history where ships would go to a you know, a different civilization and the natives never saw a ship, but they see people walking on the water, you know? Because your brain can't uh, assimilate that because what Corey said, it's we're not turned on yet, but we're getting turned on and we are ascending and we are getting this every day. So think of it as a good way, but it is true. This does happen with a lot of the majority of people who don't want to really accept this yet, which is okay. They're just at a different level and they just need to be activated. And we're getting activated with Stardust all day long, so you guys know. And we're doing it with each other. We're helping each other with, uh, you know, using sound and meditating and, and getting together like this. It's an activation. Every time you go under the stars at night, we do a CE5, your DNA has changed. We've measured it. Astronauts, twin astronauts. One goes up, one stays here. Uh, I mean, twins, uh, one's an astronaut, one's not, and stays on the the land, this is all public information, you, you've heard, probably see, heard this, their DNA is now changed. Now why is his DNA changed just because he's 85,000 feet up there floating around and he gets back and his DNA is completely different? Hmm, something's going on. There's an activation of some sorts that are happening through the earth, through the energetic fields, and of course, interdimensionally. Well, the Chinese did research where they took seeds for like tomatoes and zucchini and stuff flew them up into space, they grow the vegetables back here on Earth, and they're like from Findhorn, like super large, crazy, extra growth. And that's been documented again. So yeah, there's a lot of this kind of stuff. Oh, I can talk about plants all day, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> so I want both of you, before we start this, um, and Emery will start with you since you're already standing, you know, I don't want to inconvenience you too Sorry, much. Sorry, I gotta move a little bit. <laughs> gotta keep the energy going with everyone here, right? So. Could you tell us real quickly, um, since we all agree that we're going through a quantum leap in human evolution, I just want to get a nice short, because we got like four minutes, three minutes before we're going to start this thing. What do you, based on the ETs you've already seen, what do you think we will experience if all of us are fortunate enough to have done our homework to be ready for this quantum leap in human evolution? What will we be like? What will our minds be like? What will our lives be like as we go through this? Yeah, we're going to live a lot longer. We're going to be able to do a lot of self-sustainability stuff where we're not using gas, coal, and oil. We're going to be able to change our genetics and DNA. We're going to be able to uh, get rid of cancers and tumors and diabetes and all this stuff. And it's going to happen pretty quick within the next, you know, three to five years, I believe. I'm just saying, I haven't been wrong yet. Corey, again, we have this ascension message that's been coming in very strongly. It was the main theme of all my contacts all those years. It's the main theme in the Law of One. It appears that the beings that did the Law of One contacted you to bring this message to the next level. So what do you see happening? And maybe we could talk about some of what the Anshar told you and what their society is like. What do you see happening as we go into this new stage of evolution? What will we be like? We're going to be connected in a way that we're unprepared for, that this ascension is a consciousness ascension, that our consciousness is going to expand and blend in a way that we're going to approach all of our problems from a more cohesive way, like, you know, a seven billion processors working on a, on a problem in tandem instead of working on all, all their own individual uh, issues to process. So it's going to be it's going to be a quantum leap in the way we approach each other and our, our problems. Very good. So I gotta fill one minute now. So why don't we bring up the uh, singing bowl person? Got, I know the bowl is there. You got forty seconds. But we gotta have a player of the bowl. I think that's her over there. Or maybe she just has to go to the bathroom. I don't know. We can just own. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I guess see, oh, that's you. Okay, great. So um, we're about to turn into 11.